file thirty two of a treatise of human nature by david hume volume one this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by george yeager book one part four of the skeptical and other systems of philosophy section one of skepticism with regard to reason in all demonstrative sciences the rules are certain and infallible but when we apply them our fallible and uncertain faculties are very apt to depart from them and fall into error we must therefore in every reasoning form a new judgment as a check or control on our first judgment or belief and must enlarge our view to comprehend a kind of history of all the instances wherein our understanding has deceived us compared with those wherein its testimony was just and true. Our reason must be considered as a kind of cause of which truth is the natural effect, but such a one as by the eruption of other causes and by the inconstancy of our mental powers may frequently be prevented. By this means all knowledge degenerates into probability, and this probability is greater or less according to our experience of the veracity or deceitfulness of our understanding and according to the simplicity or intricacy of the question. There is no algebraist nor mathematician so expert in his science as to place entire confidence in any truth immediately upon his discovery of it or regard it as anything but a mere probability every time he runs over his proofs his confidence increases but still more by the approbation of his friends and is raised to its utmost perfection by the universal assent and applauses of the learned world. Now it is evident that this gradual increase of assurance is nothing but the addition of new probabilities, and is derived from the constant union of causes and effects, according to past experience and observation. In a compse of any length or importance, Merchants seldom trust to the infallible certainty of numbers for their security. But by the artificial structure of the accompts produce a probability beyond what is derived from the skill and experience of the accomptant. For that is plainly of itself some degree of probability, though uncertain and variable according to the degrees of his experience and length of the account. Now as none will maintain that our assurance in a long numeration exceeds probability, I may safely affirm that there scarce is any proposition concerning numbers of which we can have a fuller security. For it is easily possible, by gradually diminishing the numbers, to reduce the longest series of addition to the most simple question which can be formed, to an addition of two single numbers, and upon this supposition we shall find it impracticable to shew the precise limits of knowledge and of probability, or discover that particular number at which the one ends and the other begins. But knowledge and probability are of such contrary and disagreeing natures that they cannot well run insensibly into each other, and that because they will not divide, but must be either entirely present or entirely absent. Besides, if any single addition were certain, every one would be so, and consequently the whole or total sum, unless the whole can be different from all its parts. I had almost said that this was certain, but I reflect that it must reduce itself, as well as every other reasoning, 
and from knowledge degenerate into probability. Since, therefore, all knowledge resolves itself into probability, and becomes at last of the same nature with that evidence which we employ in common life, we must now examine this latter species of reasoning, and see on what foundation it stands. In every judgment which we can form concerning probability as well as concerning knowledge, we ought always to correct the first judgment derived from the nature of the object by another judgment derived from the nature of the understanding. It is certain a man of solid sense and long experience ought to have, and usually has, a greater assurance in his opinions than one that is foolish and ignorant, and that our sentiments have different degrees of authority even with ourselves in proportion to the degrees of our reason and experience. In the man of the best sense and longest experience, this authority is never entire, since even such a one must be conscious of many errors in the past, and must still dread the like for the future. Here, then, arises a new species of probability to correct and regulate the first, and fix its just standard and proportion. As demonstration is subject to the control of probability, so is probability liable to a new correction by a reflex act of the mind, wherein the nature of our understanding and our reasoning from the first probability become our objects. Having thus found in every probability, beside the original uncertainty inherent in the subject, a new uncertainty derived from the weakness of that faculty which judges, and having adjusted these two together, we are obliged by our reason to add a new doubt derived from the possibility of error in the estimation we make of the truth and fidelity of our faculties. This is a doubt which immediately occurs to us, and of which, if we would closely pursue our reason, we cannot avoid giving a decision. But this decision, though it should be favorable to our preceding judgment, being founded only on probability, must weaken still further our first evidence, and must itself be weakened by a fourth doubt of the same kind, and so on, in infinitum, till at last there remain nothing of the original probability, however great we may suppose it to have been, and however small the diminution by every new uncertainty. No finite object can subsist under a decrease repeated in infinitum, and even the vastest quantity which can enter into human imagination must in this manner be reduced to nothing. Let our first belief be never so strong, it must infallibly perish by passing through so many new examinations, of which each diminishes somewhat of its force and vigor. When I reflect on the natural fallibility of my judgment, I have less confidence in my opinions than when I only consider the objects concerning which I reason. And when I proceed still farther to turn the scrutiny against every successive estimation I make of my faculties, all the rules of logic require a continual diminution, and at last a total extinction of belief and evidence. Should it here be asked me, whether I sincerely assent to this argument, which I seem to take such pains to inculcate, and whether I be really one of those skeptics who hold that all is uncertain, and that our judgment is not in anything possessed of any measures of truth and falsehood, I should reply that this question is entirely superfluous, and that neither I nor any other person was ever sincerely and constantly of that opinion. 
nature by an absolute and uncontrollable necessity has determined us to judge as well as to breathe and feel nor can we any more forbear viewing certain objects in a stronger and fuller light upon account of their customary connection with a present impression than we can hinder ourselves from thinking as long as we are awake or seeing the surrounding bodies when we turn our eyes toward them in broad sunshine whoever has taken the pains to refute the cavils of this total scepticism has really disputed without an antagonist and endeavoured by arguments to establish a faculty which nature has antecedently implanted in the mind and rendered unavoidable my intention then in displaying so carefully the arguments of that fantastic sect is only to make the reader sensible of the truth of my hypothesis that all our reasonings concerning causes and effects are derived from nothing but custom and that belief is more properly an act of the sensitive than of the cogitative part of our natures i have here proved that the very same principles which make us form a decision upon any subject and correct that decision by the consideration of our genius and capacity and of the situation of our mind when we examine that subject i say i have proved that these same principles when carried farther and applied to every new reflex judgment must by continually diminishing the original evidence at last reduce it to nothing and utterly subvert all belief and opinion if belief therefore were a simple act of the thought without any peculiar manner of conception or the addition of a force and vivacity it must infallibly destroy itself and in every case terminate in a total suspense of judgment but as experience will sufficiently convince any one who thinks it worth while to try that though he can find no error in the foregoing arguments yet he still continues to believe and think and reason as usual he may safely conclude that his reasoning and belief is some sensation or peculiar manner of conception which it is impossible for mere ideas and reflections to destroy but here perhaps it may be demanded how it happens even upon my hypothesis that these arguments above explained produce not a total suspense of judgment and after what manner the mind ever retains a degree of assurance in any subject for as these new probabilities which by their repetition perpetually diminish the original evidence are founded on the very same principles whether of thought or sensation as the primary judgment it may seem unavoidable that in either case they must equally subvert it and by the opposition either of contrary thoughts or sensations reduce the mind to a total uncertainty i suppose there is some question proposed to me and that after revolving over the impressions of my memory and senses and carrying my thoughts from them to such objects as are commonly conjoined with them i feel a stronger and more forcible conception on the one side than on the other this strong conception forms my first decision i suppose that afterwards i examine my judgment itself and observing from experience that it is sometimes just and sometimes erroneous i consider it as regulated by contrary principles or causes of which some lead to truth and some to error and in balancing these contrary causes i diminish by a new probability the assurance of my first decision this new probability is liable to the same diminution as the foregoing and so on in infinitum it is therefore demanded 
how it happens that even after all we retain a degree of belief which is sufficient for our purpose either in philosophy or common life i answer that after the first and second decision as the action of the mind becomes forced and unnatural and the ideas faint and obscure though the principles of judgment and the balancing of opposite causes be the same as at the very beginning yet their influence on the imagination and the vigour they add to or diminish from the thought is by no means equal where the mind reaches not its objects with easiness and facility the same principles have not the same effect as in a more natural conception of the ideas nor does the imagination feel a sensation which holds any proportion with that which arises from its common judgments and opinions the attention is on the stretch the posture of the mind is uneasy and the spirits being diverted from their natural course are not governed in their movements by the same laws at least not to the same degree as when they flow in their usual channel if we desire similar instances it will not be very difficult to find them the present subject of metaphysics will supply us abundantly the same argument which would have been esteemed convincing in a reasoning concerning history or politics has little or no influence in these abstruser subjects even though it be perfectly comprehended and that because there is required a study and an effort of thought in order to its being comprehended and this effort of thought disturbs the operation of our sentiments on which the belief depends the case is the same in other subjects the straining of the imagination always hinders the regular flowing of the passions and sentiments a tragic poet that would represent his heroes as very ingenious and witty in their misfortunes would never touch the passions as the emotions of the soul prevent any subtle reasoning and reflection so these latter actions of the mind are equally prejudicial to the former the mind as well as the body seems to be endowed with a certain precise degree of force and activity which it never employs in one action but at the expense of all the rest this is more evidently true where the actions are of quite different natures since in that case the force of the mind is not only diverted but even the disposition changed so as to render us incapable of a sudden transition from one action to the other and still more of performing both at once no wonder then the conviction which arises from a subtle reasoning diminishes in proportion to the efforts which the imagination makes to enter into the reasoning and to conceive it in all its parts belief being a lively conception can never be entire where it is not founded on something natural and easy this i take to be the true state of the question and cannot approve of that expeditious way which some take with the sceptics to reject at once all their arguments without inquiry or examination if the sceptical reasonings be strong say they it is a proof that reason may have some force and authority if weak they can never be sufficient to invalidate all the conclusions of our understanding this argument is not just because the sceptical reasonings were it possible for them to exist and were they not destroyed by their subtlety would be successively both strong and weak according to the successive dispositions of the mind reason first appears in possession of the throne prescribing laws and imposing maxims with an absolute sway and authority her enemy therefore is obliged to take shelter under her protection 
and by making use of rational arguments to prove the fallaciousness and imbecility of reason, produces in a manner a patent under her hand and seal. This patent has at first an authority proportioned to the present and immediate authority of reason from which it is derived. But as it is supposed to be contradictory to reason, it gradually diminishes the force of that governing power and its own at the same time, till at last they both vanish away into nothing, by a regular and just diminution. The sceptical and dogmatical reasons are of the same kind, though contrary in their operation and tendency, so that where the latter is strong, it has an enemy of equal force in the former to encounter, and as their forces were at first equal, they still continue so as long as either of them subsists. Nor does one of them lose any force in the contest without taking as much from its antagonist. It is happy, therefore, that nature breaks the force of all sceptical arguments in time, and keeps them from having any considerable influence on the understanding. Were we to trust entirely to their self-destruction, that can never take place until they have first subverted all conviction and have totally destroyed human reason. End of file 32